All right. It looks like right. we're live, everyone. It looks like we're live, everyone. Hey. Hey, hey, out there in Twitch land, hey, out there in uh, is Twitch that what they land. call it? Uh, the Twitchiverse? I don't know. The Twitchiverse, yeah. The Twitchiverse, yeah. That sounds better. I like that that's better, too. Nice. I like that better, too. Uh, I am Jonathan Pradley. Uh, I am I'm Jonathan Pradley. I'm head of studios for and innovative technologies for the University Libraries of Virginia Tech. Um, and I'm going to be the host um, slash interviewer slash random person who's going to talk at you for a while tonight uh, for, a while for this tonight. episode of uh, not the role of play but actually play, roll call actually roll um, call. This, is um, uh, this is a new show i guess uh, that we're premiering show, i guess that we're premiering. Uh, it will be a uh, table talk style a series table talk in which we go series, back and visit some of the adventures and one shots that we played through and go a little bit more in depth into the literature how we played our characters things that um, things that you know, um, we could have done yeah, differently and done different. uh, just general analysis slash introspection about um, the literature that we are sort of basing and guiding these works of literature on. So for tonight, we are going to go all the way back to our very first session, which happened on October 30th, I believe. It was, um, it was like day before Halloween. Uh, it was um, the library's game night. Yep, it was library's game night. Uh, and that was... Um, hear us all twice Ooh, that's exciting that's a problem <laughs> uh, that's a problem I've never uh, run into before Let me go uh, the they're show. saying it's fixed now oh it's oh. fixed okay it's fine now all right someone that's is good. sending me a bunch of messages I assume about this uh, okay. <laughs> yeah I got a message that said huge echo it was awful, uh, echo, echo, but echo. apparently not anymore. Um, so that's good. I guess let us know if that comes up again. Um, yeah, definitely. But uh, we will be uh, talking in depth about the literature and just sort of our analysis, uh, reflecting on our experiences playing, uh, things we didn't do, things we would wish we had done, all that sort of stuff. I uh, got some questions. In the future, there may be like a, a dedicated host slash interviewer for this, but we'll see how that develops. Um, we're also going to be taking questions from the chat. So if you are want to post questions for us about the game, feel free to do so, and we will uh, sort of answer and uh, provide whatever feedback we can. Uh, I know that session was long ago. We're going to try to start doing this regularly so they don't get that far behind. But yeah, uh, this one we're this one we're reaching back. A uh, little ways in time, so uh, that's sort of our intro. This uh, this show uh, roll call will not normally air during this spot. This is when we would normally air episodes of the role play, and we will continue to uh, air episodes of the role play into the future. Um, this will probably move to tentatively. We're looking at Thursday afternoons, um, uh, but we'll we'll finalize a time for that as we move forward. But that's what we're looking at. Uh, and it will probably be the off week that we do an episode of role play, so we're not uh, sort of stacking every other week to be really busy. But yeah, I think that's our strategy so far. Um, part of the reason why we wanted to do this too um, is the next session of the role play, which will take place on, I believe, January 29th, is going to be a sequel to this very first session that we did. Um, and we first vi we first visited Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. There is a sequel to that book called Alice Through the Looking Glass, or it's, I think it's called actually its true title is Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. Um, the same way it's the first book is not called Alice in Wonderland; it's called Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, but we are going to be doing a sequel to that session, and we're going to use the same uh, players and uh, same game master set in the same world, and it will be an actual follow-up to the events of the first uh, session. So look forward to that, um, revisiting some of those characters, and coming back into a world and not just stepping away from characters once and never seeing them again. So that's that's the fun thing about coming back to a one-shot and doing it again. But all that being said, I will now let everybody introduce themselves and who they played in the previous session. So as a reminder, I was the GM, so um, I will be serving that role again as <laughs> podcast master. Am I the PM now? <laughs> Prime Minister? I don't know what you'd call that. I don't but, know. Um, yep. So, um, Anthony, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez. I'm an archivist here at the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Um, and 
I have been on two episodes of The Role of Play, uh, and I also run an uh, archives show on the channel here, uh, Archival Adventures, on Wednesdays at 2.30 Eastern Time. So you're welcome to stop by, and I show off items from our special collections and university archives for a couple of hours. Uh, and just kind of discover them as you do. I just pull things at random, and a lot of times it's the first time I've seen them. So um, as far as the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland one shot, I played Wayfinder Throom, um, a non-binary Loxodon ranger um, with a very unique voice. <laughs> and I'm sure the Such voice... Such a good voice. I'm sure we'll talk Such about the voice, voice at a later point in tonight's program. So good. Is that going to be under your favorite part or your heavy regrets? <laughs> <laughs> that question. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Oh, should uh, I introduce Max. myself now? Oh, Who's okay. Next? I was, oh, Max. Okay. Yeah, I was. I was going down my list on the Zoom call. Uh, Max, Sorry, that makes wanna, sense. You want to introduce yourself? So uh, I'm Max Offsa. I work here at the University Libraries running the 3D Design Studio, our 3D printing space. Um, played a lot of D&D, helping with our studios department, setting all this up. And uh, for this adventure, I played Benny uh, Cavill Jr., kind of a, a takeoff of Sherlock and his many iterations um, as a wizard and, and just interesting guy <laughs> you're right uh, you're right there yeah. Jonathan <laughs> well okay it looked like the stream might have been dropping frames um, I got distracted we'll see nobody's posting it's okay. in the chat so maybe it's just me um, <laughs> I'm keeping distracted. an eye out too okay uh, no worries uh, uh, yeah I Alice would you I introduce yourself I can do that I can do that I am Alice Rogers, manager of the Media Design Studios at Virginia Tech, which includes Media Design Studio A, a lending space for technology and board games and all sorts of different things. Uh, new to the space, I think we'll have some instruments too. Uh, and I also manage Media Design Studio B, which is a recording space in the library. Um, and I also support the lecture capture space currently, in case anybody's interested in lecture capture. Um, so all of those things. Uh, I played Arla Crabtree in our one shot. Uh, Arla Crabtree was a, uh, if I can remember correctly, a gnome druid. And uh, she, she was very kind of a little bit of a hermit, liked mushrooms a whole lot. Um, very, very much so. She did not have as cool a voice as Thrum, though. <laughs> they they really brought it brought the the best voice game to the party. All right. So yeah. So I think that is everybody. Uh, Danny uh, can oh, be here yeah. with us, uh, so we will miss her, and hopefully uh, she will she will be back uh, next session when we do the follow up to this, but. I guess we'll go ahead and dive in. So the first question I have for all of you is, had you read the work before we actually played the session? There's no order for your answer, so you just jump in and talk over each other. Yeah. I do, so really. I, yes, I had read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland as well as uh, Through the Looking Glass um, multiple times, but it's been more than a decade. Uh, they're books that I really enjoyed, uh, I have, I have, I have a little Alice figurine. Um, she's kind of chroma keying out on her hair, <laughs> but um, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories growing up. Uh, but like I said, the actual like book I hadn't read in over a decade before we played the game. Um, so more familiar is like the Disney version. Um, yeah. So you got to the next two questions on the list, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but we'll get to those in a second. But that's that's great. You're predicting my thought process. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I had read Alice in Wonderland multiple times, or both both of the books really, 
um, because I was named after Alice in Wonderland, right? Like oh. my name is Alice. Yeah. My parents were going to name me either Alice or Guinevere, but they thought that I would have trouble spelling Guinevere. Um, so they named me Alice instead. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, real real show of confidence in my uh, spelling <laughs> ability as a, you know, free child. Um, but yeah, so I was named after Alice. And so they read me Alice in Wonderland and uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass multiple times. They had purchased me, you know, multiple versions, like children's versions that are, you know, simplified and illustrated. As well as a really, like the annotated Alice, which has a lot of information about Lewis Carroll's... Uh, um, you know like different different references that are embedded in Alice in Wonderland that would have been relevant to the time but today we don't really pick up on them uh but I still haven't read either of those also in a decade it's been a really long time since I've revisited my namesake so uh I feel a little a little lost there I also thought they were very boring as a child like you know because they like you know they're being read to me and they're very I thought they were pretty dull Uh, I did like the you know I liked the animated version but you know I mean, yeah. it's very. You're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more, a lot more going on. Yeah, like like Alice. Um, I had, or uh, like Anthony, I had read it a long time ago, but uh, I mostly most of my memories from watching that animated version, the Disney version, over and over. <laughs> yeah. There's also I, the made-for-TV version. There was a made-for-TV well, version. I don't remember that. Um, which is really good. <laughs> so I guess I guess I'll also answer my own question. Um, yeah, last time I read, uh, last time I read Alice in Wonderland, I read it uh, multiple times growing up. But I think the last time I was trying to think, like, what was the last time I read it? Was when I was an undergrad and I took a children's lit class, and I actually taught a lesson based on Alice in Wonderland, um, mm. in which I made everybody write their own nonsense poetry, and uh, then, uh, you know, we talked about it with the class. It was it was a fun little lesson, but. Um, I think that's the last time I actually read it. Um, the The second question I had, most of you, did you read it in preparation for this? Did you reread nah. it? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm gonna explain why I didn't reread it in, in preparation for this. I have also like steeped myself in a lot of the media that's surrounding Alice um, sure, for sure. a very long time. Uh, also, I'm lazy, so both uh, <laughs> to do sorry things. I didn't mean that to be a call out right there <laughs> no it's fair I mean no it is 100% fair because we've gone back and forth when oh, we think about these is like how frequently like how recently do you need to have read something before you run a one shot on it it's like well it depends on the one shot it depends on what you're going to do with it and um so and it depends on how familiar you are with it. I mean, especially yeah. if you taught something on it, you know certain aspects of it and certain things about the themes, the characters, the details in a way that you wouldn't if you didn't teach it. You know, I don't know. Yeah. My yeah. concern if I had been doing this as the as the GM, I would have been uh do I cover both works in one session or am I restricting it just to Alice with the eye towards doing the sequel, in which yeah. case I want to make sure that I don't bring in any elements from the second book into the first session which the movie does right like the movie or the animated movie that i remember it mixes it both yeah yeah Yeah. well and that was that was sort of like i didn't have a plan to do a sequel for the first one really until uh y'all finished the first one and then the way things played out and stuff i was like hey i've got a couple of interesting ideas um so yeah, I didn't plan for that from the beginning, uh, but I think it'll work out because the stuff, uh, uh, the ideas, sort of played into some core things that I'm interested about. Well, I also but. think the audience is used to getting both of the stories together, yeah. so the, like bringing up something like the Jabberwock in something about Alice in Wonderland, people are going to recognize it, and it doesn't really matter if it's in the first session, <clears throat> second session, the second session being a sequel to the one shot doesn't necessarily mean that it has to only be the sequel from the book either Um, yeah and and they i mean even when you go to buy alice in wonderland it is most often bundled together both books like they they don't sell them individually much anymore because they're they're both rather short um so most publishers are just mash them together and and some of them just write alice in wonderland which is neither of the titles on the front uh, yeah. Because it's just easier and people <laughs> recognize it. Because the Disney adaptation, I mean, let's be, be honest, has had such a huge impact on what 
people know of that story because there's such so many other stories that are part of that Alice in Wonderland that never made it into that movie that are weird um, oh but give so me much. give me Carol Channing as the White Queen any day <laughs> Uh, so which know, is uh, which is the made for TV movie version? Yeah, uh, that have Whoopi Goldberg in it too. What? Ooh. I think yeah. was she I the mean, Cheshire Cat? I think or... she was the Cheshire Cat. What? Yeah. I need to find. I, this I have to now. I have to IMDb it. And it had Martin <laughs> Short. He was the he was oh the my Mad gosh. Hatter. I do not. Oh, I don't no, either. It was, great. Uh, it was like four hours note. long. It was one of those old school. It's really excellent. good. If you've not seen it, I I definitely recommend the the TV movie uh, from nineteen ninety nine. Yes, nineteen ninety nine. Wow, Archivist Kira, by the way, in the chat has told us that there's also a strange musical movie version from the late nineteen eighties, um, oh, which also some... sounds. Amazing. There's some strange. There's some strange media surrounding Alice in Wonderland. We'll dive into that in a second. Because that was actually the second question was how long ago was it that you read it? If you had read it, so which the one I think answered. the made-for-TV movie that I was thinking of is the 1985 one, not the 99 one with oh. Whoopi Goldberg. Um, Whoopi Goldberg. There's a 1985 one uh, that had Carol Channing in it. Kira um, says the musical film version the is a learn. British production. So that's, yeah, that's strange. So the, the third question I had was, do you have experience with this work from any other media or adaptations? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the answer's solid yes. Has anyone seen, like, the more recent yeah. stuff? Like, that is something I haven't seen. I don't know if anybody's seen All either the, 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 Tim, Tim, the Tim Burton version or, yeah, yeah, either of those. Yeah. I saw the first one. I didn't the live see action. the second one. I have not seen the either one. one. Oh, didn't, yes. Didn't make me happy. The oh, live no. action, it's got Roddy McDowell as the March Hare. It's got Ringo Starr as the Mock Turtle. Uh, Carol Channing as the White Queen. Donna Mills as the Rose. Like, it's got some big name stars in it. it Lloyd Bridges as the White Knight. Sammy yeah. Davis Jr. as the Caterpillar. Oh, my gosh. I this mean, is amazing. It is it is an amazing cast. The 1985 just, TV movie of Alice in Wonderland. We could just really change this to a stream <laughs> where we watch that on stream and comment on it's a commentary um, on that, commentary. you know. I think that'd be I totally mean, that'd make watch a good alongs podcast are possible for sure. through Amazon Prime on Twitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. <laughs> that is a thing. I don't think that's what we planned tonight, though. No, probably not for the best. <laughs> the future. That would be a funny segue and be like, and now we'll begin our We have a line. third show. <laughs> <laughs> We're premiering two in one night. Max, um, you have to come up with a name for that one, too. Yeah, you've named all our shows. So all right, give me a minute. <laughs> I'll give you a second. So here's some more. If we're talking about fun, weird adaptations, <laughs> there's, um, there's a book series called The Looking Glass Wars that I have read. Um, that is, I read through, I think the first two, um, they were pretty good. They were interesting take that like, basically the scenario is that everything Alice told Lewis Carroll was true. Like supposedly like it's pitched as though like not like Lewis Carroll made up the story, which is what actually happened, but that Alice told him these adventures and he wrote them down, but that she was actually from another world and he turned them into these like funny kid stories, but it's actually like a tale of a world that's like immersed in this like war. Um, and so it was, it was a fascinating like retelling of it. There is also a really weird surrealist film based on Alice in Wonderland. Um, I think it's a Swedish director. Um, he also did Dr. Faustus, uh, which is one of the strangest movies I've ever seen, even more so than the Alice version. But uh, they are both strange and, and sort of hard to get. Um, I ended up having to do the interlibrary loan to locate them. But mm-hmm. those are two of the other strange things. Uh, the, another reason why, and I'll, I'll admit that I didn't reread this, is because I also wrote a novel that tells the story of Alice in Wonderland through different co- characters backwards, basically. So I also <laughs> was had done a whole bunch of research on the topic in the process of like doing that. Um, so I also I uh, I, I've seen the Looking Glass Wars before. I've not mm-hmm. actually read it. I think I have the first book, but I've not had yep. a chance to read it. But then 
also in 2009 there was a tv miniseries called alice uh with andrew lee potts and um kathy bates and wasn't that like the serious alice in wonderland wasn't it like, uh, oh, like an a, like an adult mind trippy like drug fueled thing? Yes, but it yes, was also just <laughs> really really good. Um, and so like there's the kids version that is more close to like the original stories in the books, and then there are these adaptations of it that kind of stretch things. Um, uh, there was a a dark horror video game series based on Alice in Wonderland too. Yeah. Uh, American has been a bunch of games. Oh, yeah, American Mickey's Alice. I loved that. Yeah. Well, it there's was yeah. one of my favorites. They made it. They yeah, made the sequel. remade yeah. it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've played both of those. They're they're actually really good games. Like mm. they're not just relying on like And I have to see if anybody's people. updated them so that they're playable. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember <laughs> Anthony's picking out new Twitch, new Twitch, games Twitch content, like. new Twitch content. I do play old games on Twitch, so uh, yeah, uh, I'll have to see if those are available. I remember this is totally not the same thing, but I when I was at I w- was previously at University of Maryland, and University of Maryland has specifically like an Alice in Wonderland collection. I believe like someone collected novels from a bunch of different places, historic ones, first editions. And they have them in a collection at University of Maryland's uh, Horn Bake Library. And they also have a digital exhibit that you can go through and see some scans of some of the cool, like, illustrations and pages and also information on Alice in Wonderland. And I think it's lib.umd.edu slash Alice150 because it was... <laughs> sorry. I'm amazed what? that you remember that. All I can think okay. about is how hardcore you're <laughs> playing <laughs> University of Maryland listen, right now. Listen, this is a library stream. It's a library thing. I also, I remember it because... Let's change the the, stri- the name. Uh, uh, UMUL. No, no. absolutely no support longer. other institutions <laughs> yeah. and their yeah. work. Yeah, no, it was... I just, it's really Oh, I, I knew it because I was working on digital exhibitions at the time, and this is one of the first ones they kind of had, like, like very robustly together uh, with lots of different elements from their... Uh, back end stuff but that's a whole another story regardless uh it's a really cool digital exhibition and if you're interested in like historic you know different um different versions of the book there's all kinds of cool stuff on there yeah well hearing about that super cool special (laughs) collection um makes me think of our own super cool (laughs) special collection (laughs) no no it actually does because it made me start thinking about mark's work with um the sci-fi collection and then i was like "Ooh, what's in there what all contents in there that we could do uh uh, well Well, you could also uh uh, if if you want to see some of what's in there i'm going to plug our other show archival (laughs) adventures episode one (laughs) yeah it was Was, specifically about the was about that collection (laughs) Yeah. So really cool the VOD is available for that. Um, I think... It also has music, too, right? That kind uh, of thing. I'm not certain if it has music or not. I, I know we do have I music. I don't, I don't know if there's specifically yeah. any in that collection. Um, but suffice to say, I think Alice in Wonderland uh, permeates our culture. Oh, yeah. I know that people talk about you end up with at least one reference a day to Wizard of Oz, and I think it's probably similar for Alice in Wonderland. Oh yeah. I mean, we didn't even get jump into so. music. Like <laughs> there's a ton of songs that reference or or are some way shape or form related to it. But I mean, all yeah. that like all that sort of to say like when we think about these one shots and the way that we're adapting literature and turning them into these games. Like this is what we do with literature as a culture we take them we adapt them we turn them we change their form we tell the stories in different ways and stuff and i think that it's always it was it wasn't really planned but i think it was a good choice to start with alice in wonderland because it has been (laughs) max is like well uh because it has been adapted so many times my life switch works Oh my gosh. The, the lights in uh, the room that Max is in are on an, a timer, and without enough movement, they will shut themselves off. Yeah, and they do a lot during meetings. <laughs> yeah. And the movement switch, the laser, is over my uh, my office mate's desk, not my own. So I have a, a rope hooked to a cart across the room. You can see part of the pink string here. 
And that is my light switch <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, side note, we have a clarification in the chat that the sci-fi collection does not contain music. Oh, that's sad. Oh, I thought I thought when uh, Mark showed it off um, at ICAT like a couple years ago, there was a whole music thing with it too. Or could there be a whole music Maybe I'm thing? Mistaken. Maybe there's a secret out. music thing. It's possible Maybe. that there were iCat projects related to music inspired by it. Awesome. Yeah, maybe. I was like, was maybe. A, I definitely remember there being a, a music. iCat element, is the Institute for Creative Arts and Technology um, here yeah, at Virginia right, yeah. Tech, and so that would be a type of project that they would that they would do. Yeah. I, I'm <laughs> just imagining that. I've lived long enough to become the thing that I yeah. hate most, which is the person that just starts saying acronyms <laughs> in a meeting and never explains what the acronyms are. So you get like five, you know, halfway through the meeting and you've heard like 15 acronyms and you find you're just like, <laughs> what, what is VLA? I don't <laughs> VLA would be the Virginia Library Association for anybody out there who doesn't know. <laughs> uh, um, I, is it some so, sort of so DMV Alice or in Wonderland? CBS? Yeah. Alice in Wonderland. A- AIW. Yeah. All I could imagine though was. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, our future film series rolls to reels. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. No. You're talking about are, the are watch alongs. Watch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I gave with that a while ago. I haven't, I haven't just been holding on. So it's I want to say it's I good. kept imagining Mark just brought his iPod and was like, I really want everybody to hear my favorite songs. I want to tell them it's from the. <laughs> my favorite space yeah, it's music. My favorite space music. I want to play it for everybody and tell them it's from the sci fi collection. Here's my mixtape. That tape. would be. That would be amazing. I really want that to be the truth. I'm going to make that <laughs> my own head cannon. Uh, <laughs> but that's what happened. What if it was just Mark's soundscapes? <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, too. Oh. I love it. I love it. Because some music was good. I, I definitely remember there being music. I, I guess it wasn't part of the collection, though. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Next thing on the questions. So we'll, we'll bring this this train off the wherever it's going back on track. <laughs> Good yeah, <laughs> when you hear the title of the work, <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, and or Alice's Adventure in Wonderland, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? A lens, a, like a crystal ball lens. Why? So, like seeing, seeing an image through a curved glass surface upside down on the other side. Interesting. Hmm. This is this is my attempt to do reader response in real time. By the way, any of those <laughs> are familiar? I with mean, literary <laughs> criticism. <laughs> This would be yeah. what comes to mind for me. The Disney Alice. The Disney Alice. <laughs> well, I think, you know, through the looking glass, that's what yeah. I have to get. That's so interesting. I, it depends on, uh, I mean, I think my first thing is thinking, I, I of course, like, imagine scenes from the film, but I specifically probably think of the cards, the scenes with the cards and the croquet. Like, that's definitely the stuff that comes to mind the first, because I also remember those images like, I remember the cards images from the book, too. Those illustrations in the original books are really yeah. Um, iconic. Yeah. So, I guess my own answer to this would be, and this is probably indicative of something weird about me, but <laughs> in in that strange surrealist film, the white rabbit is a, like, stuffed and mounted real rabbit that they have articulated and animated for the movie. And ever since I watched that movie, that is always the weird thing that comes to my mind when I like first hear the title of that. <laughs> but I like do want to touch on Don't something. Don't like that. that. Uh, Don't like that. <laughs> no, it's not. It's. I mean, it's. It's like kind that. of a weirdly creepy movie. Definitely. Kind but, of. Um, kind of. That sounds yeah. creepy. Um, so, but I want to go back to something that Anthony said. You mentioned that the first thing you thought of was the Disney film. Um, so one of the things I was realizing as we were setting up for this, and I was looking for. Um, sort of our like background image and stuff. Um, I had just googled like um, you know things that were licensed, completely open, trying to look for some of the original artwork. I found a coloration that was supposedly from around that time period, in which Alice is wearing a green dress and has brown hair, and it Ooh. weirded me out. <laughs> and oh. I was like, "What has Disney done to me?" <laughs> you just brought to mind. Um, so when I was in high school. <laughs> long time ago uh, we had a, a a group that would go to the uh, the one act theater competitions in Virginia every year 
Um, and they made it to the finals one year, and they did a show called Alice at Wonderland.com. And this was in, like, 96, 97 time frame. <clears throat> so the internet was, you know, big. And this was a show that they wrote themselves, etc. But it, at no point in the production of that and the development of that show did they ever consider that Alice would be in anything but the blue dress mm -hmm. with the white yeah. apron. I mean, it has um, become kind of iconic at this point, and that's, like, <laughs> it was weird to see her in a different dress and have a different hair color, even though, you know, I don't know that the book specifies that she has blonde hair. I mean, I'm pretty sure Alice Liddell, who was the inspiration for it, had blonde hair, and I think that's why the depictions depict her as having blonde hair most commonly, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I know all, a good bit of the history the history and and the controversy which we haven't touched on and i don't know that we will but um there's a there's a lot surrounding all of that too but um yeah it's it's fascinating how much D disney's interpretation has really solidified this image of who alice i mean is i have a picture like. a picture of alice liddell here it looks like she has brown hair like pretty dark brown hair yeah i mean it's potentially it, Disney rewrote history and was just like, she should be blonde. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do right. think like the Disney depiction of Alice is, is definitely the forefront for me. Um, but other depictions of other characters have sort of taken over. Like I don't immediately think of the Mad Hatter from Disney. I think of Andrew Lee Potts uh, as the Mad Hatter. I th mm. don't think immediately of the Cheshire Cat, which is one of my favorite Disney characters. I don't think of the Disney Cheshire Cat first. I probably think of the Whoopi Goldberg Cheshire Cat before the Disney one. Like, I still can't I, believe that there's a, <laughs> a Whoopi Goldberg Cheshire Cat. And I like, I'm lo in love with this idea. Oh, I yeah. Know. See, it's just all coming back to everyone. It took a minute. It took a minute. But you started talking about it. And then I was like, oh, I have seen this. I don't think I have. And I didn't watch it all because it was terrifying. I mean, it sounds like... <laughs> Sounds like nightmare fuel. <laughs> so also uh, in that vein, and it's not media, so it's it doesn't really answer the question of like what's the first thing that like pictures, but uh, sort of multimodal discussion. I also almost always think of the Tom Waits album Alice because it was the soundtrack to a play about Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodgson, and Alice, um, and the title song, which is the first track on the album, is I. I'm going to get it snobby. I argue one of the best songs of all time. So there we go. Uh, let me throw that out there. It's got some great metaphors. Um, and Tom Waits, as always, solid. I will find, oh, by the way, those of you who are just tuning into this show and do not, like, <laughs> listen to um, the University Library's, like, radio show or anything, so haven't heard me on there. I plug Tom Waits whenever possible, so get ready for that. <laughs> You just you just brought up music related to this that was not like songs from movies about mm -hmm. this, which made me think of Go Ask Alice from Jefferson Airplane. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, it's White Rabbit. Like, yeah, White Rabbit. Yeah, White sure. Rabbit. Um, yeah. So there's again, like, uh, like we th we immediately think of like Wizard of Oz as being this thing that permeates all of our culture, but Alice in Wonderland is everywhere as well. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, fun fun game for any of you who are bored. Go on YouTube, find people who are covering White Rabbit, and judge them on whether they nailed it. <laughs> because that is such a hard song to like really do well. Because mm -hmm. that that final like crescendo is like sustained and it is is very powerful. So it's always it's really like, I always good. get to the end of it. Yeah, I always get to the end of it. Yeah. And I go nope. Not <laughs> there. Try again. Even I've seen Yorma Kalkinen and Jack Cassidy play live quite a few times and they, they'll sometimes like start it just for fun to make everybody go crazy. And they're like, now nah, we're not doing it. Cause you have to do like, you know, it's really challenging to make it through that whole song and really uh, do it well. <laughs> the archivist Kira said, this is where it turns into a Tom Waits fan cast. If the I mean, university sure. libraries would let me host a Tom Waits fan cast, I would be all over that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if they'll even let us host this for too much longer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so maybe we should talk about our actual one shot at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah. we should at some point. 
Uh, so here we go. Next question. What were your expectations going into the session? <laughs> what did you expect me to throw at you? Essentially is what the core of this question is, knowing that it was going to be based on Alice in Wonderland. Questions. Well, I think I'll you had told us I played with you before. I think you told us it was going to involve the Feywild. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I definitely expected a trip into the Feywild, but otherwise I didn't know how how hard into the story it would lean versus how much it would like conform to like standard D&D mm-hmm. depictions of the Feywild. I had expected <laughs> I had expected some sort of fancy wordplay moments just because that like I had like that's a big part of Alice in Wonderland these sort of like logic pu- not quite logic puzzles but these things that are absurd sayings like the, where the words kind of turn on themselves and so I expected a certain amount of that whether it was just like like flavor text cut like in or as it ended up being something more integral to the story um but I had expected some amount of that. That was the only thing that I like really felt I n- expected you to do. That was the expectation I had. Max, you said questions. Yeah, no, I, uh, well, you had kind of briefed us that it would be as far as D and D analog is something in the Feywild and something not very combat heavy. Um, so, I mean, my thought process was, that it was going to be heavy, like, prose and, and question-based um, riddles and such. Um, and, that, and that goes with the theme, that being tricky, you know, play on words and stuff. Um, the min-maxer in my head was thinking about skill challenges <laughs> and, you know, make, giving our team the biggest advantage and figuring things out when we couldn't figure out your fancy, clever riddles and poems <laughs> So, so for for context, everybody <laughs> in the chat, uh, leading up to the game, I get a message from Max that just says, "So guess how many uh, proficiencies it's possible to start the game with?" <laughs> <laughs> and I, mean, I go, "It's a lot." Uh, most of them, <laughs> and that was the, the correct answer. Yeah. Well, that wasn't this one. That was the practice game. Yeah. N- the practice game, my practice game character had like 13 proficiencies and I think 12 language proficiencies. And I was like, if you go deep on this, you can just be a non-combat, like, I can do it. Oh, is this for the Sandman? Because where yeah, we for the play context, tested that the Sandman. The, yeah, the, the practice. He was part of the play test group for the Sandman uh, episode. So, yeah, the, it, the Sandman. It makes sense as a player, especially for a one-shot, if you know a little bit about the setting, to optimize your abilities a little bit so that the story can flow better and things like that. So min-maxing is not always a bad thing. Um, in this case... It's never a bad thing. <laughs> also, um, for context, Max is a min-maxer. Well, is it yeah. his name? <laughs> <laughs> his name's uh, it. I don't know I'm, I'm going to paraphrase uh, Sam DeLev here, and uh, they observe about min-maxing that you have this DM who has put together, put a lot of work in crafting a wonderful story for you. Um, why would you not create a character who's going to make the best use of that story and and survive through it? Uh, like, yeah. So, yeah. So, like, I created um, a Horizon Walker as, as a ranger, um, somebody who was familiar with traveling to other planes and would have experience with the Feywild because I knew we were going to the Feywild. <laughs> I mean, so I think it comes down to, like, people get frustrated and they play D&D and they feel like their character can't accomplish anything. And that usually comes about because they they made the character in a vacuum. Like, they didn't make the character for the campaign they were playing. So it it can get frustrating. And, And so you don't have to, like, get every, like ounce or point or whatever out of your character in in terms of like pure optimization but you don't want your character to feel ineffective because unless that's what you're specifically going for and you're playing one of like one of those characters that is specifically designed to be good at nothing and be a constant burden on the party but then you also run the risk of making your party not like playing with your character Um, and that's also not 
usually <laughs> very fun for the whole party. Um, so it's it's a balance. And yeah, so I mean, uh, y'all y'all made characters that made sense. I didn't have any issues with the characters that y'all made. And we also uh, like speaking of min max you know whatever preparing we um we all made sure i think that we didn't have too many spells overlapping which ended up not really mattering because much of what we yeah. just imagined happened so like that also like you had built a story in which even if you had really like min minned your character you just decided to like make your character the worst possible you know adventure ever like you know this is a story in which your character would still be pretty effective yeah, because cause it, they would it was just be able to. Well, because well, we had people, we had people playing who'd never played before. Yeah, sure. that's exactly what I was about to bring up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and I went yeah. into it, and I was so sort of when I starting to the design of it and thinking about it, I was thinking about riddles and puzzles, but I also know because I've I've DM before. Riddles usually go one of two ways: either everybody in the party really enjoys riddles, and when a riddle comes up, they sit around and they think about the the answer. It does sort of, it's weird because it sort of stops the game in the sense that, like, everyone's just sitting around thinking about riddles, and it's sort of like you're doing something different now, but when they get it, then you sort of jump back, and everybody had a moment to sort of switch gears, but what usually happens in my experience is, like, a few or a couple or sometimes even one person likes riddles, and everybody else hates riddles, and so they sit around like nothing's happening for them, and so I've I tried to specifically design those challenges, knowing that they weren't going to be challenge like feats of strength or like normal combat, as something you still had to role play to succeed, not just I'm asking you a question and you have to sort of figure it out. Like you got to try things in the world, versus like a like a word riddle, like the Sphinx's riddle or something, where I just right. say a riddle and you think about what the answer might be and then you respond. Because those don't, and I didn't think that would be very fun to watch either like coming back at it yeah i mean i think the uh the trophy like making it around the world i think that was that riddle was perfect i think well and also we i feel did very well with it through <laughs> really they really took the i mean they got it pretty quickly uh but we were trying different things and arguing in a really fun way i felt um uh, you know i felt that it was a pretty a pretty fun like sort of route of problem solving that we went through and then we got it so it was it was fun it worked well for everyone i think i don't know i i'm not speaking for everyone other people may have had less fun well i i liked that um it wasn't one of us that was solving all of the riddles like i got the the um what's the name of that race the caucus race the caucus race. I got the caucus race riddle uh, pretty easily, but then um, when we moved on to the the Jabberwocky, I was Max. not getting that one, um, and Max was figuring that one out. And then with the T, um, I had ideas, but I was not close to really solving that one either. Um, well, it was really Danny that just sort of was like, yeah, more like slap the sky basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, we had a good balance of people who have. I think all of us have some interest in riddles of various sorts, so that helped. I think everybody was somewhat interested, so it helped us, you know, make it through. Uh, but I think that yeah, it they were they were in such a way that even though everybody kind of solved different ones almost everybody contributed to all of them right where you're trying everybody attempted things to help like narrow down what we had to do mm -hmm. yeah. yeah my surrealist riddle uh, solving uh is definitely inspired by 1990s sierra point and click adventure games oh my gosh the <laughs> best the true best max you were gonna say something uh, I was just thinking um, there was a play test for this. It I think for the future it would be interesting to have some of those people participate in this because it would be it would be interesting to know like what changed from the play test to this and and or just what their experiences as a completely different group that also you know yeah. went through these trials it, that we didn't I see. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to include some of the people from the play like, test. So um, I think that'd be great. Kira, want to jump on right now? They, they tried to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they tried to they tried to run it 
Uh, literally one of the characters tried to run all the way around the Feywild. Uh, and that one ended up being kind of humorous, too, because I had them eventually start crossing paths with uh, uh, Dobo Gogo. <laughs> like, so they just started, like, running by him, but they were, always, they were always, like, going in opposite directions or, like, crisscross and this stuff in the paths. Um, and he, like, <laughs> made it back but kept running. Like, he didn't stop when they, are ba- they arrived back. Uh, and he, like, went out in the ocean. And so he was just th- – he ended up, like, showing up as a character – uh, in That's their so session fun. because I sort of needed something for that character to be doing while they were persistently attempting to run around the world. Because they were a monk and they were like, I can run around this. <laughs> like, sort of stubbornly like, I'm super fast and <laughs> I can run. I will I will beat all of these people. <laughs> oh, we have some play testers in the chat responding. Uh, KB McNabb. Kayla <laughs> says, I was so fast. And <laughs> Archivist Kira says, I was so fast. <laughs> <laughs> so Truly, like Archivist Kira says, and some of us Uh-oh. did not run because you know heavy armor. That is true. Not all of them. <laughs> yeah, that was in. that was an issue for um, Danny's character as well. Yeah, not wanting to run. Oh, um. yeah. I uh, I thought that we would be able to get away with just coming in the opposite side and through extra planar whatever BS, we would be have run around the Feywild. So you are not. Or you could maybe argue like running around in the Feywild and then like do wordplay to trick them back on their own. So game. that's not a bad thought. And actually, one of the playtesters also attempted the <laughs> exact same thing. Tried to like envision like coming back to that place and like having gone and like yeah. having gone around the world, um, sort of thing. But the nature of the woods just pops you back out whenever you, wherever you're trying to go. Um, and so there was like there was a number of criteria for everything that just sort of had to be met um but there were multiple ways of meeting them which i think we went over like in the session because somebody yeah asked i me, think we did like afterwards. yeah i think in the post um so other question i have what was the biggest surprise you had during the session what was the thing you weren't expecting that showed up i guess that the queen wasn't necessarily a bad guy was probably the biggest twist that was the what a twist moment. What a twist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was I was beginning to think that a little bit when we... Uh, so I sort of assumed that we wouldn't have more than kind of like one big combat. And when we were battling the Jabberwocky, I was like, well, I, don't, I doubt we'll have a pretty significant combat with the Queen. What's the deal going to be there? And um, I mean, we could have had combat with Queen. We could have been, you know, real DPK. aggro going in there. <laughs> yeah, could have all died. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't quite expect Alice's circumstances. I think that was part of the, the part of it that was most unexpected. Yeah. The, so, the, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the the most unexpected thing for me was the voice that came out of my mouth for my character. Oh my God, it was the best. <laughs> it was the best voice. You surprised it was yourself. The best you voice. played yourself. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean. It was a good voice for a D and D character, though, because we could understand you still. I think so. Just advice for people who like to do funny voices in their D and D characters: as long as you can be like intelligible, it's a fine voice, yeah. whatever it is. But yeah, I've definitely played with people who have tried to do like interesting, ra- you know, monster race voices or whatever, and you just can't understand them. And I'm like. This would be fun. I, my but. character was an elephant, <laughs> so I wanted something deeper and more resonant than what my voice is. And I did not intend to sound like a Thermian from Galaxy Quest. But, but that's did. what happened. <laughs> you sound like a Thermian like Int. That's what it was. That's what it you were. So you were good. I don't it was know. so good. But... <laughs> It Star came out, and I just stuck with it, and now I have to figure out how to do it again in two weeks. <laughs> You'll get there. You'll oh, get there. Back. Oh, right. Yeah. It'll come back. Uh, I have to remember. Yeah, it'll all come back. I did yeah. a little bit of a voice for Arla, but I don't really remember what it was, so that'll be a problem. I'll have to re-listen. Yeah, we'll, we'll all have to uh, method act back into our character by watching the episode again. So there was, I just there was, and I, I do want to say, because y'all brought up like not knowing her circumstances, I did, I did run... Um, so whenever you run a one shot, and this is just general advice, always skip to the part in which you actually need people to be there, because with D and D players, like, there was a very real risk, and I recognized it that if I started you in the town, 
that y'all could end up in that town for like an hour. Um, and since we were trying to do a one shot and that you only had like three hours or so, um, I didn't want you to to get sort of caught up in that when the actual adventure was sort of taking place over here in the Feywild. But I did recognize that that does make it difficult because it takes a little bit of your agency away. And in a one shot, I would argue that that's to a certain degree that's unavoidable because so much of it is being compressed but it is also sort of a challenge of like so I, I sort of made the rule to myself that if any of y'all at any point in time in the adventure queried me about the town what y'all did while you were there or stuff then we would sort of I would sort of let y'all have some leeway with what you found out and get you the clues that you might have missed um, but I also sort of assumed you probably wouldn't because you'd be so focused on what's going on right now at least not until you got to Alice and and she started saying well I don't want to go back and all this other sort of stuff so that is definitely one of the challenges and I don't know how y'all if y'all felt like I hamstringed you in that section but um. no no I felt like it was fine and I told I agree especially for <coughs> this where we're trying to make a relatively concise one shot too it's not like a one shot that can go for five six hours if you feel like it you know uh it's one that needs to be relatively relatively brief. I think it felt fine. In fact, I felt like when we got back to the town, I was like, how do we how do we wrap this up quicker? Can we, is there something we can do to like, okay, town, go away. We, we've decided that you're not that great. See ya. Bye. And I felt like we didn't really have, I, like, I didn't think of a good, well, I wasn't there. Uh, Arla, rather, wasn't there in the room. We're back chilling and uh, showing Alice some mushrooms. Um, so. so I will say, in the playtest, they did not go back to the town. They just accepted th what the queen had told <laughs> them and were like, we're good. Because like, hmm. they, cause they, they also sort of went through, did magic, checked Alice out, trying to see if she'd been charmed, if she was under influence. They did roles and stuff. And when they sort of had come to the conclusion that she wasn't being controlled, then they took her word as, like, she just really wants to stay here, and so we're just going to let her stay here. I think we had... Yeah, I think... We had that one insight <laughs> check, right? So we knew that the queen was holding something back, and but we never figured yeah, out what we, it was. Yeah. And so, like, there's that, Suspicion. like... You know that moment. Well, <laughs> also because you're expecting this queen yeah. to be a bad that person, too. so just just being devious about the badness that you know mo most villains don't think that they're villains; they justify what they That's do. True. So, like, you know. Well, so here is a Jonathan's clever. Here, so you know. So here is <laughs> another thing about the queen. I did specifically go. They're going to expect the queen to be bad, and that seems boring to me. And so let's make her more gray. Uh, and because I think villains that are in the inhabit some sort of gray area are more interesting in general. But I will say, if your main experience with the books and the story is via the um, Disney interpretation, then she seems like more of a villain. Like she is still the antagonist in the books, but she comes across more as like stern and someone who's used to having people follow their rules and that was what I was striving for was this is not a person who is like and and I mean she is ultimately like you know this is the red queen head. or the red queen or queen of hearts queen of hearts right queen the queen of hearts, hearts yeah yeah because the red queen I think of as like being more I think of the red the queen of hearts as being more hot-headed and like temperamental and the yeah. red queen as being this like Victorian like prim like everybody listens to me person yeah, and they and they have um, so she's she's very much about like Alice like following the rules of the court and like when she's following them she's nice to her which does come across in the movie a good bit yeah <coughs> but it's when she is like being um uh, I'm not saying petulant because that's not a great way to describe Alice but she's she's disobedient that that's when it's like extreme and that's the response of the queen. And so I tried to embody a little bit of that because that's always been a defining character for the queen for me. And so, like, sh very, like, metered and controlled and, and has these, like, rules and very willing to explain them. And then, like, when Max's character wants to take her, then the, the response is extreme. Like, and it's take your heart and hold it hostage, <laughs> like, sort of thing. And there was actually Ooh, yeah. a similar situation in the playtest <laughs> where she... Um, she 
a, a character charmed somebody in her her uh, realm, and she like contacted them across the realm because she she knows when anyone's being charmed, and like broke their charm and gave them like basically like don't do that again or you'll you'll pay for it sort of thing like there is like a little thing that you know if you if you consider a D, &D world and how often somebody gets charmed across a world in any given day that like the idea of someone charming another person within her realm is direct intervention um sort of that sort of like extreme response to things i definitely had a desire to see alice out of the feywild um, I think it was partly m my familiarity with the Feywild as a player, as well as the character's familiarity, uh, because Thrum was supposed to have been familiar with the Feywild, and just the knowledge that <clears throat> removing them from that environment uh, had the potential to lessen any uh, mental effect that they might be under. Um, so getting Alice to return to the village so that we could uh, see her out of the direct influence of the queen um, just to va verify uh, that we hadn't missed anything and that she truly did want to be there with the queen uh, f for me as a player and, and for Thrum as the character it was important to take Alice back home for th that purpose I think your response was fair. I mean, you were looking after a child, making sure that they were genuinely safe. That's not a not the sort of thing that is like, well, maybe we should have been a little lazier about how this was handled <laughs> sort of response. Not a, yeah, not a jive at the playtesters, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also interesting. Um, I think that there's so much other media that portrays, like... Like, there's no place like home, right? Like, you know, like in Wizard of Oz, like the idea that like you should want to go back to the mundane, like you should like there's no reason that you should want to stay in like a fake false fantasy world, right? Like there's a lot of media. I think of like Terry Pratchett, who I read a lot of like there's they have a similar whole similar story, um, which is We Free Men, um, in which like a girl's brother is kidnapped and taken into the queen of the fairies and like she sort of discusses and in, in that world is a little different in that like everything is literally false like everywhere you look is slowly being built like very quickly while like if you look away it's not there anymore but if you look it's like oh world world here's a tree it was there the whole time don't worry about it um, so like playing video games where when yeah you look it's, ex away, it's exactly responds. like that yeah it's exactly yeah. actually like that and so um you know, I think that there's a lot of media that sort of portrays it that way. But, I mean, it's interesting to think about, you know, the validity of that argument um, well, in yeah. some ways. So one of my most frustrating things uh, that I experience in media is when someone who, like, th you get this character, they're depicted as being, like, bored of their life, and some strange thing comes out of nowhere and is like, actually, like, you're the chosen one, and there's a whole magical world of adventure waiting for you and you're special there and they spend way too long being like this isn't real there's no way this is true this can't be happening i've got to go home i actually had like a a, a story idea one time it was just the person who immediately accepts everything they're given about strange worlds and stuff and it's just like they're like so it turns out there are other dimensions they're like great cool can i go like and just has that like because I'm like that's what I would be like if if someone was like all of a sudden there's a magic world <laughs> where all of all the mundane parts of life that are like paying your bills and like working like a job for like 40 hours a week was like you don't have to worry about that because now you're special and you're off in a magical <laughs> world and all this cool stuff is here to find um, it's like how would I not be excited about that well, I think the difference you're talking about is the difference between like a, a children's story where the the author is <laughs> kind of responsible for what the takeaway for the story is. And if the takeaway is if you leave your home and family, you'll find something great, which is, <laughs> right. is not what you necessarily want to give to children as, as a yeah. takeaway. But and then the difference is the adult, you know, once you have some uh, some power over where you can and can't be. Um so basically, you're just talking about you want to write Doctor Who stories because that's every Doctor yeah. Who companion. They're like, 
Doctor Who shows up. That's weird. I'm all in, though. What <laughs> planet are we going to now? Like, I mean, that's, you know, that's what they are. Um, and I think this, this take on it was that kind of more of an adult take of a thing that sometimes, you know, the, the grass is greener on the other side of that hill. And uh, maybe you should just leave your squalor, you know, town that was apparently just letting you live off of like live rats you caught with your hands well, and Ed, Ed stuff. all they was wanted explo- was the mushrooms, mushrooms right and... they're exploiting her right like i mean like also well, yeah, or, yeah some of them i mean were. we found some of them were not but some of them were i do say i i assume that you had fi- you had figured out this reasoning beforehand but i do appreciate that you had a like cut to find reason on why they wanted us to go find this little girl and it wasn't just like because we're a town, and that's goodwill towards men, yeah. and like we look out. Well, for I mean, each that other. was their which, story. like, is <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But you know, like we were able to question that, and there was a, a more like I, I, I'd say real, real to a D and D setting, because you know, having a magical child of the harvest <laughs> is not necessarily a very realistic thing, but <laughs> but to a D and D setting where you have this child that like you've they've narrowed down over the course of weeks or months that like the only thing that's changed our town is that little girl's not around and nothing's growing anymore. That had to be it. Let's figure out how we get her yeah. back. I mean, so I do appreciate that. That was like logic and yeah. reason to that. Stories have to be internally logical. I, I, I always notice sometimes I watch a television series and you can tell, you can tell the writers wrote the first season and they had the whole thing planned out. And sometimes they wrote like the whole second season, they had the whole thing planned out. And then they wrote a third season and you can tell they had no idea. They probably didn't even think it was going to make it that far. And they start doing things because they have to keep a show running and the internal logic of the world just breaks down because things no longer have like reasonable explanations for them. And that's why I'm always of the opinion that TV shows should end when TV shows should end and they shouldn't be drug on just because they got good ratings, but I don't make TV shows, so I don't get to make those decisions. Sure. But, yeah. I'm I mean, I I agree. I'm, I'm also a horrible capitalist, so, you know, I'm, I'm not there to make money just to make money. I'm, I'm there to make quality yeah. over that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I mean, that's cool. That's what I hear when you say that, at least, is, is that you should let the quality of the work play out, and then once you've, you know, reaped that bounty you know in the the fertility you know the fertile land type of thing um you'd leave it alone like maybe you could come back to it i don't know it's like reading dune books like there's a certain point where you you realize that he was just getting paid a lot of money to write dune books and he didn't want to write dune books anymore <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I guess I should go back to the questions eventually. Uh, yeah, you don't. You don't what? have to. You also don't have to. Re- you can just like ask the questions and not reference them too. You can just like, y- we never uh, know whether it's a question or not. You know. That's true. Uh, what were you expecting to show up that did not show up? Mm, probably a fight with some playing cards. I did consider it. I'll be honest. I think I expect, I expected to fight some playing card people or something analogous to so that. So if you know. had attacked the queen, you would have been fighting some playing card like <laughs> elves, probably Woof. to your immediate, yeah. your immediate deaths. But <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of my expectations were met. Um. Hmm. At this point, I'm struggling to remember oh. what didn't show up. We didn't really have much of the, like, have a growing in size and shrinking in size randomly. Yep. Oh, yeah. That, I did consider that element. Trying to, I did consider trying to put more of that in there. And there was the element, like, y'all weren't really eating or drinking anything while you were there. Because if you had ate stuff from there, which right. it did become clear because y'all, y'all did dig into why Alice was getting unique food and i was glad that you did because that did illustrate that aspect of the story um and you guys were just wanting to know if she was poisoned which is fair (laughs) it's a fair question um yeah but i thought about trying to do more of that but i was really like i feel like this is another thing that would just get you could get real distracted with and i don't know that it's really required to sort of go this one shot and so i was like well i'll just avoid it and 
maybe some... I half expected to grow or shrink when we drank the tea. Mm. Yeah. It's not a bad thought. <laughs> um, what NPC stood out to you and why? When there a che- what was the Cheshire Cat uh, yeah. and analogous guy? Thanks. There was oh, a Tabaxi. Nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that, I mean, that was the character I kept thinking was going to keep showing up. I thought he was going to keep, like, maybe providing, you know, disembodied dialogue for us or something well, like so that. So he did, he did um, show up a lot more. She did show up a lot more she, for the yeah. playtest group. So Link Minx sort of existed as a, sort of like um, the Cheshire Cat acts in the story as, like, a somewhat helpful but not really helpful Kind of voice. taunting almost. <laughs> so, yeah. A Microsoft Word paper yeah. clip. Like that's, that's a good, that that's a good analogy <laughs> for the <laughs> Cheshire Cat. <laughs> like, va- vaguely helpful. And you're like, I don't know if that really helped me, paper clip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that advice was great. No, I, I honestly, the, in my mind, when we got Alice and we were going back to the town to figure things out, I thought there would be an opportunity to, like, make the cat happy mm-hmm. and for Alice to continue on this, like, adventure of her own. And b- basically it becomes the Alice and, and the, the Cheshire Cat adventure. And, like, technically we don't break our oath because Alice is still in her realm, in the Queen's realm. Well, or at least, you know, I don't break my oath. I, I mean, but, if y'all uh, had really pursued that, I would have tried to figure out if you could accomplish uh-oh. it. But um, How could you accomplish it, that, though? That Well, so this, it's a hard sell to Alice because she's got a, a castle and all the food she wants and a, basically a queen to take care of her versus, like, who's this weird cat that's smiling in a creepy way that you're saying <laughs> I should live with now? Like, But, I, I mean, I wouldn't have rolled it out if y'all were just like, yeah, she needs to go live with the cat. I really, ap- I did appreciate Alice. I was like, this is, this is Jonathan's version of Alice. Like, not like Alice is like, Ooh, everything's so interesting. And like, I'm just like, so like chill. Alice was not chill. Alice had no chill. And it was a very Jonathan version. I of do that. imagine that Jonathan. Yeah. Jonathan thinks all children are like this. Yeah. Probably. I, don't, I can't, I can't <laughs> confirm or deny. <laughs> <laughs> These allegations <laughs> against me are unfounded. <laughs> To, to any nie- nieces and nephews, this is unfounded. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it was Dobo Gogo the Soso Dodo, um, and oh. specifically the form of the dodo that was on the trophy um, that spoke to us and and moved. Yeah, I enjoyed it yeah. a lot too. Uh, <laughs> we got cool. a we got a message from the the playtesters in the chat that they really enjoyed Timony Slouch, the Mad Hatter mm-hmm. uh, halfling who was mad that you stole the star from yeah. this guy. Yeah, he seemed pretty angry. He seemed pretty cool with what we ended up doing, other than I think we scalded yeah, him maybe potty. temporarily. That was my fault. I apologize. <laughs> Not really. I mean, er- I thought everyone knew that that was going to happen. I kind of did, but I was like, yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> so he was, he was there okay. mostly to provide um, a little bit of role play and a little bit of a because cause I had sort of assumed the stars one would be the one that would be the easiest to sort of figure out because um, there was a lot of different potential solutions for that. And so he was there to sort of, if you went the route of like removing the stars from the sky, um, to provide a little bit of a barrier. He's not, he can't actually stop you or really impede you in any way, but you sort of got to either deal with him or like, you know, put your hand on his head, and just like push him away and be like, <laughs> get out of here. Yeah. Um and I thought it would be a good time for y'all to have fun, like, role-playing with somebody. So I was like, yeah, we'll just throw, we'll throw old Timmy in there. I mean, also thematic. <laughs> T. Sure. Mad Hatter. But he's mad. Actually uh, angry. I, <laughs> I don't know if anyone else knew that my initial intention for my character was to be this, like gruelly investigator character that was deep into alchemy and had been hunting this crazed alchemist who had been making potions in the form of tea and like hurting people and I had made it entirely so that there would be an an easy encounter for Jonathan to to put into this one shot and when Jonathan was kind of like ah I don't it doesn't matter I don't care I was like okay he's figured other things out he doesn't need like a 
a hook for somebody. But originally, yeah, the Benny was this, like, specialized wizard that had been sent from some academy to, like, hunt down this mad... The, the under the name the Mad Hatter. Uh, I like the idea of it. I was worried about guy. adding a new combat <laughs> like into the time because the test the play test went over by a good. Oh yeah. Um, so I was I was already sort of trying to streamline and cut things out, and I was like, I can't add anything else in, or we're gonna be here until midnight. Yeah. Um. So. Well, there was a potential. Yeah. So <laughs> here's here's a question that was. Uh, sort of specific to this one and how long did it take you to realize that you sort of quote weren't in Kansas anymore like that this was what I mean by that is like the normal rules of D&D don't necessarily apply and if they do they don't apply in the way that you're used to and that you're going to have to role play in this world with really more freedom but that that was like a different experience than what you might have been expecting I think, uh, so I was imagining that that might be the case anyway, coming from the Sandman playtest, um, because the final, like, spoilers, spoilers for the Sandman episode, the final battle in that is a very non-D&D battle, and that was super fun, and so I figured that there might be some elements of that in in the whole game as a whole but then when we got to the caucus race and it became very clear that no typical forms of magic or stealth or anything was going to work there I was like I bet a bunch of these are going to be like this where like you can't just use a particular spell or a particular skill or check and make something happen this is going to be where we all have to like do other things and I had prepared speak with plants and I was like I can just speak with these plants, can I? This isn't cool. I had prepared this. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it was fine. It was fine. I wasn't angry at all. But, you know, um, yeah. I'm getting mixed messages. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting mixed messages. I, yeah, I would say for me, I think it was also probably around the caucus race when I was really catching on to exactly how it would differ. Because... Uh, even in D and D, visiting the Feywild, you expect strange happenings to occur, um, but they still conform roughly to the rules. And and so it wasn't until solving the first riddle at the Caucus Race where it was like, okay, this is not something that we're going to solve with the skills as written on the paper. Yeah, I, j- I just assumed <laughs> from having played with Jonathan for a long time. I was, I was going to make up some. It was going to be a lot of just guess. I mean, by the time the Vorpal Blade section came around, I was like, I know exactly what we're doing here. This is So I did figure. No because problem. That is, I mean, I'm glad you brought the Vorpal Blade <laughs> up because the Vorpal Blade is a and d official like, canon reference to Alice in Wonderland. Um, mm-hmm. And... I was actually like, should I incorporate this? And I was like, no, because it's already there. And does it make sense for me to give them the thing that's because is it like, is this an interpretation of literature? If this is just already part of the world or are we just playing D and D at a certain point uh, sort of thing. And so I was specifically avoided the Vorpal sword and the whole mythos of the Vorpal sword as, as this head chopping off thing. But, um, I was like, they'll go down that road. I must guarantee. <laughs> Someone will be like, where, well, where do we go to get the Vorpal Sword? Because we got to kill this Jabberwocky. I know the legend. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I mean, I think I can't remember if it was me or someone else that, wrote, that rolled like a pretty good history check mm-hmm. to say like they kind of had heard of this and figured out the, that there was a legend of it. But yeah, I was trying really hard to write rhyming schemes for when my turn would come around. I was like, I had my tablet over on the side over here, and I was like, yeah. no, that doesn't quite rhyme. And then the syllables are off, and then it's like, it's your turn. And I'm like, ah, snicker snack. I, I saw you over there. I saw you over there doing something to the side, and I was like, man, Max seems real distracted. I'll, I mean, it's not his turn, so I guess it's not that big of a deal. And then other people were like asking you stuff, and you're just like, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I was like, man, he's really focused on whatever this is. And then you read your poem, though, and I was like, oh, okay. I was like, nice. I, that's great. I, wanted, I was trying really quick. <laughs> you know, get into the character and, and be witty and smart. So sometimes it's hard to be as smart as your character has been rolled to yeah. be. 
So, you know, it's like... I'm never as smart as my characters. <laughs> I was going to say. That are either. smart characters. Oh, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I, I was, yeah, I was probably maybe I'm, as smart as Arla. Arla wasn't that smart. <laughs> she was pretty oh. chill. Yeah. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, so, uh, another question I had was, um, how do y'all feel about... Do you feel good about how you resolved the conflict? At the time, y'all seemed really worried about it, because the first thing you asked me, <laughs> as soon as I was like, the game's over was did we screw up essentially <laughs> yeah is she actually okay i could yeah i think 15 it was 15 years for us to later interpret whether <laughs> i mean Spoilers. i still worry a little bit because um she was characterized as being really young mm-hmm. and she definitely didn't have a great situation at home but she's now here in this essentially fantasy world where she can't even just go and eat the food that's readily available. They have to import it for her. Um, and so I do have concern over what that will look like as she grows up and whether she'll truly be happy there in the long run, um, which I suppose we will maybe learn a little bit more about when we play the sequel. <laughs> Yeah, so I will go. I will go ahead and I'll tell you this because I would have told it to you anyways. Because y'all haven't heard anything about the sequel at this point. Um, it will be a, a number of years in the future, likely probably like a decade for your characters. Um, so, All right. spoilers: you will get to see how it goes <laughs> off into the future. Uh, and and are we still gonna be level five? Now I'll yeah, I was about to say I'll let y'all level up. Maybe I don't know. I was considering like eight. Well, I'll I'll give you the actual level. Eight in a decade. Uh, y'all got real. We y'all got real. Adventuring you got party. real lazy. Well, what if we? Yeah, what if we aren't an adventuring party? Are we still a party at this point? Are we? Is it like um, something where? I, I thought we were hired for that one thing. No, like, y'all, y'all I, a I have a I have a wandering tribe to return to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe yeah, maybe it's getting the band. Tribe. Is this like a Blues Brothers they, situation? If, I kind of love the idea of If y'all wanted to be a getting the band back together situation, <laughs> I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> well, wait, no, what was it? Um, I think the headcanon we came up with was that Benny had did work for some sort of agency, and that's who was hired. And he had previously worked with in- different individuals, but I think. Arla and uh, oh my gosh, why can't I remember her name? Thurum had already kind of had a background. Was that what? It was no. something like that. We come up with some stuff. I don't know if it ever got it ever got actually why said on I stream. Why can't remember Danny's character's name? This is gonna make me so uh, sad. Uh, uh, I don't remember Danny's character's name. I don't because uh, Ar- Arla's character was like they had like known each other. They had met in the I woods. I have my notes. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I'm going to look it up if I can't find it. But yeah, Thrum was a wayfinder for the Comorthessa, um, and that, it, like, protecting the nomadic Words. community was the reason um, that they had crossed planar boundaries and been to the Feywild, etc. So they, they had a job. They were just uh, basically hiring out when you came calling. Well. Yeah, I mean, we may do a band getting back together sort of situation. I think that I like that in my in my heart of hearts. I um, think that would be funny, especially if it's going to be ten years later. Yeah. Um. Which Arla's a gnome, so she basically won't have aged very much. It's like no time for it all for a gnome. We're all looking up Danny's character's name, aren't we? <laughs> We're all working uh, on that. I mean, yeah. that's what I'm working on. I mean, I don't remember, but I'm not looking it up. <laughs> I am looking it up because it's going to bother Oh, me. I was looking up my notes. Oh, no, I wrote those down physically. My thing that's for the stream was just my, like, intro thing. I wrote it out so that I wouldn't mess it up. Mm. So while while someone figured out what Danny's character's <laughs> name was, I've got a, I got another question for you that I think will oh, have some sure. pretty interesting... Uh, answers what other works of literature or media do you think could have given a similar experience as this session and i will say the sandman is not a valid answer because we already said <laughs> that it was pretty similar sorry can I'll you restate the question yeah what other works of literature or media it doesn't have to be literature uh, do you think could have given a similar experience as this session because uh, sort of at the core of this was this like broken logic um, wordplay 
sort of um, gameplay. So it, it might seem odd, but I do think um, I I think you could get there with the Cthulhu stories, but taking it the like little little Cthulhu route, like the if you've ever seen the animated what? animated what? short. What is Lil, Lil Cthulhu? Lil Cth- what is Lil Cthulhu? <laughs> yeah, so if you're not familiar with it, I I would recommend uh, searching for it. Uh, there's like a YouTube video. Somebody animated. <laughs> it's an animated thing with Lil Cthulhu. Uh, Cthulhu turned into like a small like, chibi version of Cthulhu, and and. Oh yeah, there's merch. Yeah, there's merch. It My is, daughter has a Lil Cthulhu is, stuffed animal. Uh, taking that approach to it where you take it out of like the, the super horror and into this more like children's version um i i could see that i could also i'm thinking like the little prince um mm, potentially as i could see that uh, i don't know why my brain went to little cthulhu though <laughs> Probably yeah, I'm still it. trying to piece that one <laughs> yeah together. that's a bit eldritch <laughs> yeah, it's, like, <laughs> it's a bit eldritch if we want to get dark I mean, if we were going to get dark, um, <laughs> there was a series based on in the Marvel Universe, um, Legion, um, about... Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> it, it was funny because it references Alice in Wonderland a lot, but it is... it is. Oh, yeah. yeah it does. It is sort of that, like... Legion's a super cool Danny's character. character's name was Lydia. Oh, Lydia. my gosh. Thank you. Lydia uh, Amastasia. How did you think? I went back into our email thread where there was a link to the character on D&D <laughs> yeah. Beyond. Oh, that's, yeah. that's, good job. That's a good one. Yeah, I kept thinking. I'm just happy I didn't delete my character because I thought I had off Beyond. I may have. So, you know, she might be a little different next time you see her. Well, so we do have, um, uh, so thanks to Watsi, they gave us a activity kit for the, the libraries to use on our stream. So it, you will have to transfer your characters over to the official, like, campaign for role of play because <laughs> we could do that now Brandon. sweet yeah i love yeah. the idea that maybe all of Does our characters live in like one universe yeah. like all the characters could come back at any time yeah i mean i mean i, I think for certain stories that'll make sense um i'm still i'm still sort of brewing over a seven part one shot series based on the dark tower series so <laughs> no <laughs> Veto. Veto. <laughs> you don't like the Dark Tower series? I veto. I veto Stephen King continuous work. Short stories. I also are think fun. Discworld. Yeah, Discworld. Uh, uh, Terry Pratchett loves fun little wordplay things. I'm pro Discworld. And how come, also, how he come had Discworld gets a pass. <laughs> Have you? Th- there. No, or I'm if you're going you. for something full of lots <laughs> of puns and wordplay, there's also Piers Anthony's Xanth series. Mm, yeah. Um. So, I always thought it would be fun to run like a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in any universe D and D, but that's me. Like, did you ever? There's a Star Wars version called Tag and Bink, and it's really funny that they're like secretly behind the scenes, like they were the people who got the plans for the Death Star, and like they like stop the trash compactor by accident from killing you know luke and them like they did all these things behind the scenes but they're also sitting there like waxing metaphorically about like life and probability oh, and you know different things happening in the universe like one point they're like walking along the second death star and they're like you know there is a lot of these catwalks that don't have rails like, somebody's just gonna get fall into one of these and look at that look how endless that is this is just not safe. And they just, like, walk off scene. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, uh, so, like, behind the scenes and these other things. In the things. chat, archivist Kira <laughs> has said that she vetoes your veto, Max. Oh, wow. I don't care. <laughs> I veto her veto as a studios member. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just trying to... Feigned power. Just trying to veto yeah, we'll see. I have to. I have to think about it first. I, I'm sure you will get people that aren't me interested oh, yeah. in that. I mean, so I've already had like, on, on the little spreadsheet we keep that's <laughs> already full. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. See, there you go. Don't even worry about proof it. majority. Look at that. I think uh, so. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> dear. Yeah. Um, no, nice. there. I mean, nice. uh, in terms of, for the most part, um, you know, a lot of these are just one shots that are intended to stand on their own, but. 
I mean, there are certain stories that are series and would make sense to have people come back and their characters continue to show up. So I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Since this was our first streamed program ever, mm -hmm. do we want to talk a little bit about the tech and how we did it? And uh, this one was pre-recorded instead of live. Um, but sure, we can talk about that. So, yeah, we'd been planning for this for a while. Um, and we bought a device um, that was intended and to for a, I want to I want to clarify for a while like a year before yeah. the first stream I think <laughs> is when uh, like we had sort of like there was a joke but then we're like no but actually let's do it and then like the next meeting we started talking about logistics and different things and it was supposed to be live in <laughs> in a room yeah. and it someday will be like someday our yeah. plan is still to have yeah. this like be like have a space where real people are seeing each other and making rolling real dice and you know not that we're not real people but um you know like <laughs> that the people will be together I'm just a in person, person. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so it was it was right. max that threw the idea out it was yes, at the end max of one did. of our like work meetings and he was like but what if we did this and i was like i'll ask <laughs> we'll see if i get told I, so a year is is actually the <laughs> is the proper estimate for when we like diligently started yeah. doing a thing but yeah some some like five or six years ago when streaming was first becoming a thing i had pitched it to our eight our assistant dean at the time or associate dean i don't know how does that hierarchy work who knows again? associate dean what was brian uh, so, uh, i think associates hire an assistant i don't know it doesn't matter <laughs> I can't remember. Anyways, our AD <laughs> at the time, and he wasn't opposed to it, but we also didn't have, like, I don't know. He's been in the chat for a couple of uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> we, we haven't had the sordid history that we do now with doing off-the-wall projects and making them successful. So, <laughs> what we call that a like, sordid <laughs> history? I think it would be a, um, you know. history. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is, it's actually purely successful at this point, so that's good to know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was proposed way back when as, like, a, mm, let's just think about it, maybe. And I didn't think we'd actually ever get off the ground with it, you know, play, you know playing D&D &D for, for the university and uh, putting it out as content. Um, but I'd been thinking of ways to do that, and, uh, you know, the, the time was right. So you had to jump on us. Yeah, so there we were, were actually... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, th there were definitely additional challenges with um, moving it into the virtual format. Uh, not just <clears throat> we'll we'll talk about technology challenges, I'm sure, but also just with um, getting people to take part. <clears throat> that I don't think would have been as big a challenges if we were doing it in person. I, I think it would have been easier to like go and visit somebody and talk to them about it and and onboard people to. Uh, who may not be intimately familiar with role-playing games or um, we definitely had interest from more people, but doing it in this uh, remote technology driven format, it's been harder to get people to actually come and take part in the games. Um, than I think it would have been if it was in the, in the room in person. I think yeah, that's definitely like true. That. So, I mean, yeah, having, for, go yeah. Ahead, yeah. I was going to say for like for clarity purposes, the first episode of the role play was supposed to air on April 1st, 2020. Uh, which, of course, we all know what happened in March, uh, <laughs> which is the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Uh, Virginia Tech uh, did not come back from spring break. And eventually, actually, the University Library shut down uh, during the, the height of that, that beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then uh, we turned around and it took us until October to really iron out how we were going to do this digitally and, and all that sort of stuff. And then even that was, even that wasn't ironed out as well as I would have hoped. But uh, we figured listen, it out eventually. I don't, I don't know if it's still ironed out. I mean, we're still, it, this is still an iterative process because again, we bought the device for its, we brought, bought the Pearl 2 by Epifan for having a number of HDMI inputs that we could use from cameras to go directly into the device. And so instead we've had to have people's internet and, you know, have setups at home where people are, you know, streaming from their computers and over their home internet typically into the Pearl, which that process alone
alone is pretty tricky and took us a lot of, you know, work to get through. Now I think we're through it pretty well. We've gone through it several, several times and we're doing okay so far. Uh, this stream not- has actually had the least hiccups of all <laughs> of ours. <laughs> yeah, I think so that's far. True. But it's still... All I want to do... It with because there's a Scott Pilgrim game that just came out is do Scott Pilgrim narrator voice. It's like it's it's mostly ironed out. It was not ironed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is. It, is it a was little not. Like that. Uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know. But we, I think we also have found beyond like ironing out like best case scenarios. We are also going through like this doesn't have to always be, like right now in the, these circumstances. We do we do okay with like medium case scenarios sometimes. It's like eh, stop using that. We'll just just go to this thing instead you know we'll make it work yeah, well, yeah and, and the first the first session was pre-recorded because we weren't sure how it was going to work well no, that and yeah. it was also yeah. pre-recorded because it was going to air during game night and we didn't want to yeah and a lot of our <laughs> yeah a lot of our, our our sort of <laughs> associated human resources were were tied up in making sure that was successful <laughs> And we also didn't want to add to the stress of that night by being like, we're also going live, like, right now for the very first time. Um, so there was a couple reasons. We also just weren't sure about the technology. But, um, well, because it was virtual you, game night. Yeah, it was, yeah, virtual it was a game virtual night, game which, night. Yeah, which was the first time we've done that as well. So we were starting yeah. a lot of new things all at once. <laughs> um, but for those, for those of you who are wondering, like, how we've done the stream um, and how we're doing it now versus the, the – the second two sessions that came after the the for one that was pre-recorded, we did with Zoom, and we actually cut up the Zoom window um, into um, a streaming software. You could do it in OBS, but we were doing it on the Pearl, and then streaming that, and that was that was a pretty big problem for us. If somebody dropped out of the Zoom, all everyone's cameras rearranged and. Um, or got off center, so that wasn't great. Um, we also, also had a lot of desync for audio too. Yeah, that was the, the biggest audio. issue, honestly. <clears throat> yeah, the audio got desynced a lot, and that's just a Zoom issue. Like it happens in Zoom, even when you're not streaming. If you have a long Zoom session, like I've been sitting at in a meeting with people, and I've noticed their audio is no longer synced with their video. Um, yeah. And in the meantime, we were working on SRT streaming with the Pearl device because we knew it was capable of and. Um, did a lot of work behind the scenes and that's actually how we're doing it now we the the four of us are in a zoom call and that's our our back channel and that's so that's how we're talking to each other in real time but at the same time we're all currently streaming to a single device that's then putting everything in this nice frame and making sure everything's synced up and then shooting it out to twitch yeah and uh for those who are in like in Blacksburg near Virginia Tech, we do try to provide like different microphones and computers so that way like people's setups can be a little bit simplified, but it is still, I mean, it's still a process getting the SRT streaming up. Um, yeah. We could definitely we'll potentially provide some documentation on how SRT streaming works a little bit if people were interested. Yeah, Blue Yeti microphones yeah. Um, yeah. or Blue Snowball microphones, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, webcams, all that. <laughs> People hashtag not watching. sponsored. Hashtag, yeah, hashtag not sponsored. Not, none of this is sponsored <laughs> yeah. at all. I think I think that was my. Uh, we are sponsored, yeah. sponsored by Virginia Tech. Yeah, University Libraries. <laughs> um, and and for those of you who are watching or listening, if you are interested in doing something like this, we do offer our expertise through the forms of consultations. Um, so you can talk to us. We're happy to do that. We give consultations on other topics. So that is just a thing we're sort of used to doing so this is just one more thing that we're willing to talk to you about if you have questions or something like that but um yeah the technology challenges have have definitely been there um, i'm actually producing this episode in addition to to um being the host yeah. of it which is not something we like to do all the time but uh no this it's a lot of work <laughs> this one seemed a lot more off the cuff than like running a a, a D one shot so i was like yeah i'm okay we just we'll just do that it'll be fun <laughs> um yeah I was, was i gonna say something else Mm-mm. nope not gonna say anything else also <laughs> one other thing that it's taken us a little bit to really pick up on is so for the university libraries i mean we we do this stuff as our job so we're used to making sort of a professional product and like things that are refined and putting them out there 
and um, <laughs> like things that are edited, that are put together, that are scripted and stuff like that. That's just part of <laughs> seeing nose is shaking their head. So this no, is no, no. Uh, no, I'm I'm not saying no that that's not what we typically do. I'm saying no, that's inappropriate for Twitch as yeah. a platform. And so uh, that's one of the things we're trying to we're we're picking up on is that. Um, you know, this is a place where things are a little bit more off the cuff, and that's fine, and that's sort of expected. That's the norm. And making ourselves okay with that when, you know, that first stream, we spent so much time editing and trying to make everything perfect for it. And then after the first one, how much time it took, I, I literally sat down with Alice, and I go, maybe it doesn't matter if it's if it's terrible. <laughs> what oh, if I the, just... What if the, yeah. the end of the first stream, when we had the, like, promo video for the second uh, one shot where I had pre-recorded my promo and, and was talking about and I never got it to a point where I actually liked it because it, it was, I had written down what I was going to say and I had points I wanted to hit and I must have recorded it like 20 or 30 times and I was finally like, I'm done I'm sending it to them and I hate that video, I think it's horrible and I really just should have done it live and it would have been much better we're doing but, it live. <laughs> no, Jonathan, uh, but at I have the time, that. I had no experience streaming on Twitch. I knew Twitch was a more informal, more do it live, and if you make mistakes, it's fine. Uh, place, it's not as produced as, like, say, YouTube or uh, an Instagram or uh, uh, other places like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, looking back at it now, I'm like, I would not choose to do that again in that way <laughs> yeah i don't mind well, our produced intro that we made we made a produced intro that like jonathan and i are on um that like we read a script and it's very like you know line by line um and then i cut it up and i color corrected everything because everything was blue for some reason the camera we we tried to adjust the white balance wouldn't let us it just was like no you're gonna be blue enjoy this enjoy this content um and yeah. it took forever I don't know. And then, and then at the end of the day, I don't think either of us were really happy with it. So no, neither of us were very happy with it at all. someday we'll probably refilm it for like YouTube as sort of like an intro video, to, like for yeah. the stream, because um, like I know do. you can do, yeah, like a stream intro video. But I think we would prefer it to be much more casual than that. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have clips from our games. Really, is what that I'd too. like it to mostly be, is like little shots and scenes of people doing funny or interesting things or dramatic things yeah <laughs> i just so my head cannon for all these things that we're talking about is everywhere i mean for that it's like month like 80s sitcom like yes oh my gosh yeah. that'd be so good <laughs> And then when when Anthony said when he shot his promo video, for some reason all I could think about was Anthony playing uh, his like clips of his own game just with himself with different outfits on, <laughs> like him explaining as like a DM, and then being like whoa, and then like rolling some dice, and everyone being like, you know, I just for some reason I, when I thought promo video, I was like it's Anthony in a bunch of different hats. <laughs> being his his players for his own game he's like you'll see something like that next week we'll have to do that for an advertisement somewhere along the way that's going to be an advertisement that we film um i'll write it on the list of things that needs to be like for ads needs to be filmed so that'd be excellent um i mean i still want to do the studio just for the students in our studios the like uh, student worker highlight idea where we like take a short video of them doing this and like smiling or looking and then have like the NFL like data sheet <laughs> popping up. So you do that for the people playing in the session. It's like Max Offsa, manager, 3D designs you. Player type, mid maxer. Oh my god, my face. Quote of the day. I roll 20s. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Greatest, greatest achievement, one at D&D. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, my greatest achievement now is uh, convincing a demigod to not exist by sheer talking to him. <laughs> you're yep, you're a part yep. of that. <laughs> we were that uh, yeah. did one of our TNT. Games. Just just convinced a demigod. Like what? What if you didn't exist? And he was. It's like okay, roll that charisma check. 
<laughs> uh, so does anyone have any final thoughts on Alice in Wonderland, our D and D adventure? <laughs> Should we wrap that up? And that or any other thing talking about? that we want to kind of end on? Cause we're getting towards eight o'clock. Yeah. Um, Session two should be an epic level campaign. <laughs> oh, you want an epic level campaign? Uh, We're all level. 20. I think it was it was a good start for our uh, whatever it is that we're doing for the role of play. It was it it was a good starting point. Alice in Wonderland was a great introduction, um, and I think the campaign itself was well made. Uh, it was a lot of fun to play. Um, Thank you. The um, we did specifically choose uh, Alice in Wonderland for that reason. We thought it would be a good like intro, because I had actually already prepared and tested the Sandman, um, but we were sort of like, I don't know that we want to start with that one. That one's, you know, Alice in Wonderland. Like we've talked about, like this whole session is has permeated popular culture. Like it is hard to be like a thinking human being in the United States and not know what Alice or. or various places in the world and not know what Alice in Wonderland is and be at least moderately familiar with the story whereas Sandman's more niche uh, niche uh, how do you say that um, sort of thing so we did pick something that we were hoping and it's imaginative and we were hoping it would be fun and, and stuff so it would be a good intro So, and then I took us well off the road map <laughs> with the second session <laughs> no but I mean I think I think there were you know good it's fine though well, so you get to host your own roll call where we talk about <laughs> the sheep look up. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully we'll have a host for the show then, and they can ask yeah. me questions about it and, and my choices as DM. But, um, yeah, yeah, that'll be interesting. Well, but I think that was a good comparison because Alice in Wonderland is children's literature. It was fun, and I purposely <laughs> made characters who were like, I don't care. What are you doing here? Yeah, I'm just here to stand at the door. Like, who were who were supposed to be sort of humorous and comical yeah. and the sorts of things that would show up in children's literature, and then yours was serious and it dealt with very, uh, uh, <laughs> like very topical end of the world, uh, you know, 2020s type stuff. Yeah, the, the timing of the second one w- will be something that we should talk about when we when we do the uh, yeah. roll call, because um, it it was. Very close to election day. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, and, um, but I think those two, because I mean, I, I did want people to understand that the stream was going to be, there were going to be serious things. There's, there's going to be fun, just humorous, childish things. There's mm-hmm. going to be whatever. It's going to be a plethora. It's not just going to be one. So I think having them back to back was a good way to differentiate and say, we got a whole mess of things to look forward to. Uh, get ready for it. Also, can we turn 2020 into an adjective? Man, this is... I think it already is. I mean, for us right now, it's up to us to sustain that, like, for the next generation. We'll do what we can. I just refer to last year as hindsight. (laughs) (laughs) I think it should become its own own grade. I have a drum set over there that I could do do it on, but I don't have it. I thought you were suggesting, like professors should give that out you got a 2020 on this paper and you're like oh my gosh <laughs> it's like you go a b c d f 2020 yeah. it's definitely it's like you did worse <laughs> that would hurt a lot <laughs> <laughs> uh well so then at first it's like and it would work out too because you would be on like a hundred percent system and you'd see the 2020 at the top and you'd be like whoa oh because it'd be like it's gonna be great <laughs> All about. Oh it's well, yeah, I want to we thank ready. everyone for listening and uh, <laughs> participating in our in our stream today. Oh, Jonathan, do you want to? Did you want to do? The I was I was also it? wanted to say. So you might have noticed we have some new graphics on our stream, yeah. uh, and yeah. we would we would like to thank uh, Trevor Finney for his hard work uh, and putting these together for us. Um, yes. And uh, I think he's going to sort of continually try to look at them and revise them over the time that we do them and um, see what we need as the channel evolves and new things. And I think Anthony's talking with him now about the archival adventures and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. 
Um, I did want to make sure before we signed offline that I had thanked him for his hard work and appreciate it. I'm very excited. I love the little book logo at the bottom. It looks like the stories are coming up and we're we're in the literature. Look at us. <laughs> very fun. And of course, we want to thank Virginia Tech University Libraries for sponsoring, you know, our work here and what we're doing today on the stream. You know, we wouldn't be here without the university. Mm -hmm. right. without the approval <laughs> of our administrators <laughs> and we definitely <laughs> want to thank uh our mods in chat yes, uh, our kira, tonight kayla. we've got archivist kira and uh kb mcnab and uh definitely thank you for the work that you're doing there absolutely yeah. and jonathan for doing the production work that's that's as we already referenced no easy feat you and said that and i was like oh yeah i'm producing i should go look at the, <laughs> the control <laughs> mechanism <laughs> So I, don't, I think thanking me, you might have done it too soon. I don't know that that was... <laughs> Anti-thanking anti -thanking Jonathan. Um, We're taking so that thank yeah. you back. Taking that thank you back. Uh, so you can join us in two weeks to see us hopefully probably play Alice in Wonderland or Alice Through the Looking Glass, you know, sequel to our previous previous campaign uh we may you never know it might, might throw something else out who knows uh but we'll see that's that's the plan for now right yes the plan for now um, and uh look and on for wednesday, yeah archival adventures on wednesdays at 2 30 and look for this program roll call uh on Thursdays. upcoming thursday afternoons we'll get the onto the um schedule that shows up when we are offline um i don't think the definite details of when it's going to happen are are nailed down yet yeah no. it's tbd we, um and it might depend a little bit earlier today we were like what day should this be on <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of a preview of how the behind the scenes looks <laughs> we also uh just as a heads up we are expecting to have workshops on this channel this semester so we're going to have different types of we're not like they could be a varying in like type of workshop but certainly technology types where we walk through doing projects and certain types of software that's definitely planned uh, but stay tuned for those those will be sporadic and taught by various uh, Virginia Tech University libraries staff and faculty so we're really excited to bring that to the channel and share some of our expertise to the Twitch audience that's true yeah well has anybody else got anything else they want to say uh if you're interested in the role of play uh be sure to email us at role of play dash g at vt dot vt dot edu uh <laughs> sorry i forgot how, how that ended and also uh you can uh sign up to be on a role of play session using our the tiny url it's bit.ly slash role of play with capital r and capital p um that probably, I don't know if that was going in the chat, uh, but it's it's definitely on our page and it's available like in the text. So, And, and who's it any, open to, Alice? It's open to anyone, I believe. Oh, wow. So we're looking for VT community, anyone from the Blacksburg oh, okay. Christiansburg area, or anyone who is doing work in libraries. So even if you're not That's right, VT yeah. library, any other library. Oh, Sorry, yeah, I wasn't sure how open link. we were with that. Awesome. Thank you so much because I am sure listening to me spell that out was not necessarily the best way to get that information. Um, yeah. But you know, here you're we are. Alice is on top of promotions <laughs> slash all the things you're supposed to do at the end I'm of really the stream <laughs> slash podcast. I'm really not. not. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, it's probably time for us to figure out who we're going to raid. <laughs> oh yeah. So oh. Gonna that, <laughs> that seems like an Anthony what? thing. Uh, I will look and see. Um, you know, we should probably go for another educational organization and go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium again. That was so okay. fun last time, even though they, they ended shortly after, but it was still cool. Who lo who doesn't love otters? Everyone loves otters, right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you got them queued up, Anthony? Uh, I just sent you their, their Twitch ID. Oh. Okay. All right. I assume I just Since click this button that says raid a channel. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, follow us over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, they are currently uh, showing penguins tonight. Um, Sweet. They, they stream um, the 
various creatures that they have at the aquarium, as well as educational programming, and they are a really good uh, Twitch channel uh, to follow. I, my immediate thought was, how can we incorporate penguins and do some sort of crossover episode? <laughs> that would be so great. Uh, We'd have to figure out what they were they would have the night of, though. We'll have to figure uh, it we out. Maybe we it out can, we'll them. have to contact them. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Be like, y'all do penguins on this day, and we'll make... <laughs> <laughs> we'll do pink ones. We could do a multi stream. Batman we could do shot. a multi stream with them. It'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. all so much. Good Thanks. night.